Hello, everybody. I'm Paul Rose. I'm the head of expeditions for National Geographic Pristine Seas. And my life's work is meeting scientists with really ambitious hypotheses and turning those ideas, their risky ideas that have been formed up in a lab, turning those into action in the field. Now, of course, like all the best adventures, it comes with some unexpected hazards, like this project here. This is me in the Arctic very recently. And our bear dog was very unhappy when I was diving under the ice. He was very nervous. And on the last dive of the project, he independently brought an end to the expedition by, when I came to the surface, grabbing me on the head. I had no idea what was happening, except it hurt like hell, and it lasted a long time. But it felt a bit like love. He wanted me back there. And to, to me, when I look at that sign, and I sometimes feel these lumps on my head and these scars, it's lovely just to remember that beautiful moment in the field. My work is at the front line of field work. It really is where the magic happens. It's where all the numbers come from. Every single science data point, every field observation, certainly every science paper, helps drive global economies and informs smart political decision making. And here's what that looks like. Limpets tell great stories. When I was the base commander for the British Antarctic Survey at Rothera, we were working on limpets as part of our climate change project. It's a really great idea. Limpet shells grow a little bit like tree rings. So if we can look at, look at limpet shells, we can learn a, quite a lot about past climate and also project future climate naturally. So it was pretty simple at first. We'd swim around, collect hundreds of limpets, very quickly get them in the lab, keep their feet cold in the minus two water that that is, analyze the shells and get it back in the sea very quickly. Now these are long dives. You can see it's very shallow. So they're long, cold dives. In, and that water is very nutrient rich. So it's very murky. The ice is on the move. You need to use a line, so you sometimes when the wind closes up the ice, you can't get back up. But in those kind of conditions, the line gets caught. They're really long, difficult dives. And then the science team one day said, all stop. We think we need a map as to where the limpets come from and also make sure they go back exactly where you found them. Well, imagine the workload then went up, you know, 10 or 100 fold. But of course we did it. We had the limpets all marked up with the yellow nail varnish and we swam around with these complicated maps and then afterwards, when we're still feeling the cold from the first dive, we'd be back in getting extra cold, swimming around, you know, number 74. Where the hell did he come from? And we'd, <laughs> we'd get them back in. Uh, but you know what? I absolutely loved it and the whole team loved it because we recognised and you feel it and you know it that you're at the front end of climate change and you're making a big personal difference. Now, how did I get into that? Well, I got into that by being terrible in school. I, I certainly couldn't have come here, but I hated school. Uh, the, the teachers were the enemy, and all I wanted to do was get away, but I did enjoy watching television. So when I was 11, all these people were whizzing past me over it. Jacques Cousteau with his team traveling the world on Calypso. Hans and Lottie House with those incredible black and white images. When you look back on those black and white images now, they look a bit grainy. But in those days, wow, there's a whale shark, you know, here it is. And for me, as a young boy, it had to be him. I mean, just look at the title, Mike Nelson Battles Armoured Car Robbers Underwater at a Desert Lake. And for me, that was it. He's a fictional character. The others are real, but he's a fictional character. And every week he was having testosterone adventures in the water. And I thought to myself, that's for me. Uh, but that dream didn't help at school, if anything, as you can well imagine, I, I declined because I just had this crazy dream and didn't engage with, with the school. But then, luckily enough, I was saved by all people, by a teacher, a geography teacher, who took us to the Brecon Beacons, which is on the English-Welsh border. It's a very beautiful place. I've never seen anything like it in my life. It felt big and wild and beautiful, and the weather was really powerful, and I absolutely loved it. I discovered I was naturally good at it. I was really good at long days in the hills. I was really good at crossing rivers. I had a, a good sense of safe routes up and safe routes down. I had no idea I was doing mathematics, but I, I was there with a map and compass, and I had a good instinct working out how to get there. And then I particularly enjoyed, because I hadn't experienced it before, that sense of teamwork and leadership at the end of each day, where all the tents were wet and the sleeping bags were wet and the boots were wet and the waterproofs were wet. Get everything back to the youth hostel, get it all hung up and cleaned and mopped the floor and help with the cooking. And I couldn't have said it at that time, 
But I still remember sitting on the step of the youth hostel, peeling hundreds of potatoes into a bucket. And I thought, and I'd never felt so alive. I could not have described it at that time, in that way, but I still, here with you all today, I can feel that moment. And that energy, that sense of confidence and being good at something, plus the general buzz of being out in bad weather for lots of weeks, you know, I had that glow, got me back to school. And in those days, if you passed anything, you could leave. Um, but, but I was rated to not pass anything. But I got back to school and I managed to pass something. I passed metalwork, uh, ordinary level pass. Um, so that means I could leave school, and I'm happy to share with you all today, that remains my highest academic qualification to date. Um, with that same energy, I, I managed to get into professional diving, a diving instructor, and also mountain guiding. So I was working at sea, I was working in lakes, and I was working in the mountains. And I bumped into scientists and something called science support. Because, you know, scientists need a lot of non-science support, you know, from cooks to airplane pilots, all of those non-science support jobs. And this is a great example. This is Jeff, Jeff Severinghouse from Scripps. With a whopping great equation, which is almost indecipherable, it certainly is to me, but it was about how and why we're going to collect ancient methane from the ice. And of course, he needs people like me to help do that. But before we got stuck into the work, here we are on the Taylor Glacier in Antarctica. When we first land in a place like that, from a science support side, I'm thinking, right, get camp up, get the food and fuel in, get things established, get the science laboratory tents going, let's get to work. Particularly in a place like this, which looks undeniably beautiful, but it's a very hostile place. It's one of the windiest places on the planet, and certainly it feels like one of the coldest. But before all that can happen, there's a wonderful moment of pause where either Jeff or Vasily is up that ladder because there's a perfect height step ladder, and with the right light and the right distance by over on the left there, the scientists could tell the features in the ice exactly where we started to drill. And it's a great moment, a moment of great patience. I'm keen to get going to work, but guess what? It's all stop. The world stops. Eventually, we get the go-ahead and we set up camp. And it's a small camp, but it's highly technical. The outside is very sort of industrial. We're drilling holes in the ice. We're collecting those big ice cores. We're preparing the cores. We're putting them on the melter on the left-hand side, which is a 1 million BTU melter. It's a big physical, practical, semi-industrial job. Inside the lab, it's highly technical, highly precise. Even when the tent is being shaken by the wind and there's a lot of noise and racket going on, all of that analysis going on inside that tent is true, high-quality laboratory. Up in Greenland, on the ice sheet, we couldn't drill the holes because of the way the ice is formed. We had to use sort of open-cast mining techniques. And that was right up my street because it's hugely physical. And we would chainsaw and shovel 11 tonnes of ice, put it in the melter, and then extract the gases and, and, and carry on for the methane. And one of the things I did learn on both those projects, a big surprise to me, is you have to do a whole season wearing a plastic bag because of the microfibers coming from our Gore-Tex and elsewhere can contaminate those samples. So here you are, working hard in a very challenging environment, freezing cold, wearing a plastic bag. <laughs> Rotherham Research Station, which is my base, I was the base commander here for 10 years, undeniably the most beautiful research station on the planet, was the launch pad, the hub, for science, hundreds of science projects going from the coast all the way down to the South Pole. A key moment, in a research station life is when the supply ship comes. It's a really great thing, only once or twice a year if you're lucky. And in there would be food and fuel for the next 18 months. There'd be the new fresh team, there'd be science gear, there'd be new, new machines, new people. And the food was the most important. And for me, when this was going, and it's still called relief, which is the old term for relieving the base. When relief was going on, I used to walk into the galley and smell fresh cucumber. And that was like, yep, we're going to survive, no problem. In the remote camps, which is where I spent most of my time in the Antarctic, they're very mobile, so you're travelling light. And we're using these lightweight Scott polar tents, you're input by the um, you know, pickup trucks of Antarctic, these small twin os aircraft, maybe quite a few leaps to get you in. So once you're in, you're very remote, you're a long way from the base. And 
the aircraft would not leave until you double-checked everything and, most importantly, made a radio call back to the base so you had good comms. Now, when a ski-equipped airplane departs, it's really noisy and there's tons of snow and ice blowing around. But once it's gone, there's that exaggerated silence. And it's a wonderful, wonderful moment. You go, well, it's just me and the scientists in the field, 100, 110 days, traveling completely independent. It's an amazing feeling. So no matter where we are, if we're on a research station, in a small technical camp on the Taylor Glacier, in a remote camp, or in a very cold camp, this is one of my old camps near the South Pole, the work goes on. And that work that goes on in the field is exactly to the standard that was set in the lab. Whether it's the frequency or the type of samples that are being taken, whatever it is, it's got to be at that standard. And you don't see that in many industries, you know, when people are really tired, exhausted, same old food, terrible weather, you've got to get out of the tent now because you've got to take that sample right then. Our work at Pristine Seas, we have a similar method. We work from the surface to the very bottom of the ocean. At the surface, you can see we're using scuba diving, we're using remote cameras, a bit deeper, we're using special deep dive techniques. Then we use our submarine down to 400 meters, and below that we use these remote drop cameras, which have been all the way to the bottom of the Mariana Trench, and back up. It's called Pristine Seas because Professor Dr. Enric Saller from Scripps was writing science papers. And one day he said, you know, every single science paper I write is like writing an obituary for the ocean. I need something that's practical, physical, that's really going to make a difference. So he came up with Pristine Seas, and why not find, explore, and help protect the last truly wild, pristine places in the ocean, like putting money in the bank. Now, we can measure pristineness in lots of different scientific ways, but for me, I always like to go on that first dive with Dr. Alan Friedlander, our chief scientist. I know him well, and even from a great distance, I can tell what he thinks of the, that bit of the ocean. And in this picture, even without knowing Alan, you'd think, well, yeah, that's, he's happy. That's a pristine bit of water. We use our submarine a lot. That's me in there, live reporting from the submarine. It's great science platform and a great media platform, but what a tool for politicians country leaders and ministers of the environment. We get them in it, and we often get them in to their bit of the ocean. It's the first time they've ever been in their ocean, first time they understand what's going on, and typically they get to love it. And of course, if we love it, they can then be empowered to protect it. So the front line of field science is hugely exciting. I mean, a very quick snapshot there. You can see it's physical, it's dynamic, it's committing, and there's a sense of energy about this, we're really getting somewhere. And yet when we look at these amazing things like the Sustainable Development Goals, you know, it's a terrific, terrific set of global goals, or climate change and how we talk about it, for people like me that work in the field, it looks dull, it looks bureaucratic, it's full of politics, and even worse, it feels remote and a bit tedious, like it's quite okay to miss these global targets because life goes on. You know, so what? You know, one and a half degrees is the Paris Agreement. So what? 30 by 30 campaign, protect 30% of the land and the sea by 2030. Life just seems to go on. It's not, it's not real enough. So there's a whopping great uncomfortable gap between the front line of science, which is dedication, energy, commitment, the sense of progress, and it's physical and practical, and then the way that it's described here in the press, which not only can it be tedious and dull and just a set of numbers, but it can also be you know, completely open to, for, to false news and false reporting anyway. So we've got to recognise that gap and fix it. So what are we going to do? Well, first we have to recognise there's a gap. There's a big problem there. And to fill it, we need to activate, in the first instance, the politicians and our big business leaders. And I think the way to do that is to somehow find a way that they feel what happens in the field. If they felt the same, if when we looked at politicians, we thought, well, oh, that person looks like she's just come back from Antarctica, working with, working, working, digging tons of, tons of ice. Or that person, you know, she looks like she's just been, come back from big deep scuba dives. Or that person there's been climbing. We need to somehow get that sense of energy into our politicians. And I think the way we can do that is by all demonstrating our values. And we have to accept but we can't expect society to make informed and sometimes difficult decisions based on a set of numbers or goals that look as if they're algorithmic 
or mathematical projection. We need to, every time we see those numbers, go, this is, these numbers have got people's life in them. They're out there every day doing that piece of work. They're alive. They've got the passion, the drive, the dedication, the sacrifices that have been made. Because even today, with all of our remote sensing equipment everywhere, we still need scientists in the field to actually make this happen. So I think if somehow we can recognise and celebrate the field scientists, we can make all of these global goals more personal. And I think we can then make them more achievable. So it's true. Science exploration really does mean our survival. Thank you very much.